the very center of the passage that I just read is the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, particularly the gifts of the Spirit, gifts that were given, that have been given to glorify God and to build up the church. And now, okay, we'll just get it out there. I'm not going to talk about it much, but this area of theology the theology of the Holy Spirit and the, the gifts that the Holy Spirit provides. This is an area of disagreement within the landscape of Christianity. Uh, some faith traditions would be, uh, would consider themselves cessationists and, you know, just put in the most general terms, they think that uh, at, least, at least some of the gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament um, were... Uh, were given to be exercised only during the apostolic age, okay? There are other faith traditions, and many of them are much younger, but there are other faith traditions that actually have as their foundation um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, specifically the ones that the cessationists are uncomfortable with, Namely, those gifts like speaking in tongues, that's always the big one, uh, the gifts of healing, and so on. And so I'm just going to put it out there that there is some disagreement in terms of which spiritual gifts are functional and active and building up the church today. Really, the only thing I want to say about that, the only thing that I want to say to kind of guide us into the sermon that I've prepared tonight, is that God has blessed his people to do his work in the world. He has blessed us with gifts to serve the church, to serve one another, to shine his light in the world. And if God has given us these gifts, which he has, we are to put them to use. We are to put them to use in the right ways and with the right motivations, whether they make us uncomfortable or not. Got me? When it comes to spiritual gifts, my sense, and it's a little bit of a fear, is that all of us... Uh, when we kind of see the spectrum of gifts, we, we immediately kind of categorize them as, uh, well, these are the really important ones, and these are the kind of mid-range ones, and these are the ones, you know, we don't even really understand how those could be uh, valued so much. And I think that that's wrong. I think that putting these gifts into some kind of a hierarchy is exactly what Paul is speaking against in a passage like this. Because what it does is it potentially limits the body of Christ, the church, to uh, function properly and to do the work that it was called to do. I'm reminded of that instance in Matthew 16 where Jesus establishes the church. And he says this, you've all heard these words before, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind here on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In essence, Jesus in this passage uh, gives us a measure of authority to uh, kind of shape and develop the church. We have real decisions to make about what the church is going to look like. And that passage came to my mind this week as I was thinking about spiritual gifts. What if that passage applies um, at least indirectly to um, our uh, hierarchy or our view of spiritual gifts? And if um, you know, if we're binding and loosing when it comes to how we view particular gifts, um, I would ask the question, is God going to give us gifts that we don't value highly enough? I would argue that he's not because they're going to go to waste. And so this is an area where I think that we could use some, some, uh, some diligent discernment, I guess you'd say. 
So, uh, we, we need a proper perspective. We need a healthy appreciation for all of the spiritual gifts that God pours out on his church. And if we don't, if we don't value one another and the gifts that we have to bring to the table, we are going to be forever uh, in a less than functional state as a church. I'm just concerned that we don't underestimate God and what he has to give us and in so doing sell ourselves short. In Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. That is an inspirational teaching of Jesus. But is that what life in the church is like? Is it supposed to be like that, though? Now, when people refer to the gifts of the Spirit, they are usually referring to those listed in one of four places in the New Testament. And I thought it would be helpful, I've never heard this in a sermon before, um, to just compare those lists back to back. I want to give you the full picture here of... Um, well, in three instances, it's Paul writing to different churches, and uh, in one instance, it is out of First Peter. But the most common one, the most probably well-known one to us, is in First Corinthians 12. And it says this, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good, to one there is given, to one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So that's 1 Corinthians. We find another list in Ephesians 4. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for the works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The third place is 1 Peter 4. He begins, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it as with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. And then Romans 12, we'll just read the last couple of verses again. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now you will notice, I'm sure, that the lists have some overlap, but, that, but they are by no means identical. There's about 20 gifts listed in all throughout those passages. Some are more common. I mean, some we exercise in this church on a daily basis, and some are quite unique, at least from our perspective. But, you know, I was thinking this week, and Zach and I actually did a podcast on this uh, that we put out this week. Uh, you know, when you think about it, where are these early Christians um, getting these lists, okay? Now, this is scripture, 
and this is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, we're talking about the early church. We're talking about uh, the first generation of Christians in many cases. And so the Holy Spirit comes and is pouring out these gifts and I'm sure that, that in each different church, in each different body of believers, these gifts looked a little bit different. And so they're trying to work out, uh, Paul in particular here, I mean, he is trying to, to work out all of these different gifts that are, that are manifesting themselves. And, and he's trying to, to navigate through these, and he's seeing different gifts in different people and different gifts in different churches. And he's probably having a difficult time keeping up with all of the gifts and all of the wonderful things, all of the wonderful ways that people are serving one another and serving the communities that they are in. And so the list is a little bit different in each place that we find it in Scripture. That in itself tells us something about just this wide diversity of gifts that the Spirit pours out on us. Now, my goal tonight is not to provide a description of each one of these gifts. Rather, I want to just kind of draw out, using Romans chapter 12, a number of guidelines that we can use as we think about the spiritual gifts and exercising those spiritual gifts for the edification of of the church just some guidelines and i think that if we go by these guidelines that that regardless of what our view on cessation or what gifts are functional today regardless of our view on that we're not going to be able to go too far wrong so we began to see last week that paul has shifted gears here he shifted gears from his previous topic of discussion which we spent a lot of weeks on chapters 9 to 11 talking about the problem of Jewish unbelief, talking about, you know, how is Israel going to be saved? And, and now he is moving on to some different subject matter. And he gets very personal and he gets very practical, shifting the focus onto Christian believers here and now. Here and now in his context, but also here and now as we sit and listen and put ourselves under God's word. For 11 chapters, Paul has been explaining the human predicament and God's response, God's uh, act of deliverance in the face of our human predicament of sin. And now he is ready to suggest our proper response to that great gift of salvation. In other words, this then is how we ought to live. In verse 1, which we looked at last week, he urges us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. In verse 2, he urges us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In other words, our response to God's grace in our lives is the desire to serve him body and mind, okay? So then the question, the logical question that comes after that is, well, how are we to serve him in the best way that is going to be pleasing to him? And that's what brings us into our passage tonight, verses 3 to 8. God, it all starts with God, God has provided us with spiritual gifts for just that purpose. God has given us gifts with which we can respond to his grace. And the first guideline that I want to mention tonight is that these gifts are given to every believer. These gifts are given to every believer. Verse 3, the beginning of verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to what? To who? Every one of you. Now, not every gift is given to every person, but every person is given a unique set of gifts. For those who are in Christ, there are no exceptions with whom, God, with whom Paul is addressing here. There's no exceptions. That means that all of you have a vital function in the church and in the kingdom. 
Each one of you is uh, as well a member of one another with Christ as our head. And so no one, not one of you, not one person who was in church this morning, not one believer in Jesus Christ who is invested in the church, not one person can ever say, you know what, I, I'm the exception. I don't have anything to offer the church. Nobody can say that. Paul does not allow for it. And so he continues by, by giving us uh, this list, or giving the Romans this list of spiritual gifts, and I'll just go through them really quickly. He mentions the gift of prophecy, which is the gift of speaking an appropriate word of God into a, into a given situation. He talks about the gift of serving. You know, that, that gift of serving really encompasses so many things. That's one of those, one of those umbrella gifts. It encompasses all of those, all of those practical things that, that need to be done to, to sustain and enhance the, the life of the church and, and existence in the kingdom. It's, it's all of those little things. Little and big. Shouldn't have even said little things. Look, already, I'm struggling with, you know, differentiating the gifts. So prophecy and serving. The next one is teaching. The, the gift of a clear, systematic way of presenting God's truth to his people. Encouraging. The gift of, of applying God's word not to a specific situation, but, but to a specific individual speaking God's words of life into an individual's personal situation. The gift of giving, which is a gift of, of a generous and intentional and a thoughtful heart. The gift of leadership, which is the ability to, to guide and direct a group engaged in a common task, and then mercy. The gift of a particular concern for a particular group of people who are in need spiritually or materially and so that's the list from romans and as i mentioned before this is not an exhaustive list but but this is um, the list that paul is seeing manifesting itself in that congregation in rome in fact and i'll just tip my hand here a little bit I believe that any and every gift channeled into God's service is a spiritual gift that God can use to build up his church. Every gift brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ is a spiritual gift that can be used to strengthen the body. And there are so many different gifts with so many different implications. You know, just at Christmas, I was, I was thinking about this this week. At Christmas, there was someone in our congregation that, that is a, 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 an amazing woodworker, okay? And he, he uh, cut out and he uh, fashioned this cross, and it has a barbed wire crown um, around the, 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 where, it, where they come together, and it's just this beautiful thing, and I have it in my office and, and since Christmas, every time I walk into my office, that is the first thing I see. And it's such an inspiration, and it centers me, and it helps me to focus on, on what I need to do. And would you say, uh, woodworking, is not, woodworking is not a gift that's listed in Scripture. It's not in any, any one of those, those lists. And yet, this is a gift that I believe is spiritual because it was channeled, it was channeled into the service of God and service of one another. And look, there are just, there are infinite, there, there's just so many gifts that, that all of you have, that all of you enjoy. And I believe that everything is spiritual. And so that just, that just broadens the, the spectrum of how we view spiritual gifts and, and where we see our place in the church and in the kingdom. It's just an amazing thing. I think that, that sometimes God even blesses the church with, with new spiritual gifts sometimes. 
As the church moves through time and as civilization develops, uh, new technologies and and new things come into play, new ways of relating to each other. And and with that, God continues to provide for the church to to pour out gifts that can be be recognized as spiritual gifts and exercised for the building up of the body. God provides uh, everything that the church needs in, in every new context. And that, to me, is an amazing and wonderful thought. God continuing to create, continuing to be intimately involved with his creation, uh, uh, providing in every possible way. But the point remains, I got a little bit off track. All of us have something to contribute to the work of the church all of us without exception. Now that's much different than the perspective of the world, isn't it? The world who appreciates the the young and the rich and the powerful and the influential. The world that, you know, if you're not any of those things, it really doesn't have much use for you. It doesn't have uh, much esteem to, to give you. Brothers and sisters, God is not like that. God desires to use each and every one of us because he has specially gifted each and every one of us. And that is a beautiful reality. But it comes with a responsibility as well. See, there's no basis in Scripture for uh, avoiding the responsibility that God gives us. There is no basis for... um, receiving a gift from God and then, you know, deciding not to put it to use, okay? Uh, there's not a basis of Scripture for that. There's, there's really uh, no excuse that you can make. And there's also no basis for arrogance or conceit or pride when it comes to gifts either because, you know, uh, we might value some gifts more than others, but all of those gifts come from God, and so, so by, by, by viewing one gift as if it is lower and, and less important, actually what we're doing is, is insulting the God that gave those gifts to us. So we need to be very careful. Verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Now this is a somewhat complicated phrase. Do not think more highly of yourself within the context of these gifts. Think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance uh, with your faith. What Paul is doing is encouraging us here to see our lives and our service to God according to the standard of the cross. He wants to remind us that no matter what gifts you've been given, that all of you, all of us, are sinners. We're all on the same level with regard to our need for God. And if the gifts that we enjoy, as I just said, come from God and not from ourselves, then we're on an even playing field there, too. There's no reason for us to be arrogant. A significant part of our responsibility to the church and our responsibility to acknowledge the gifts of the Spirit within the church is in the way that we see others. We all have a part to play, and every part is vital, so we can't afford to look down or look up at one another, okay? We can't afford to think that my gifts or your gifts are more substantial than other gifts. Instead, we should just take a posture where we rejoice. We rejoice when each and every gift of each and every individual is exercised within the church. So, first principle, the first guideline that I gave you is that everybody has a gift, everybody has a part to play. The second one is this, and it's made very clear in verses 4 and 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So, 
Second guideline is that our gifts are to be used for building up and contributing to the health of the body. How do we contribute to the health of the body of Christ? We serve one another, okay? If we're part of Christ's body, if we're part of the fellowship of believers, if we are part of the church, then Scripture tells us, Paul tells us here in Romans, that in a sense, we all belong to each other. And so if we belong to each other, then we are counting on each other. And because God is the head of the body through Jesus Christ, God is counting on us to work together as well with diligence and with unity and with joy. See, your gifts make me stronger. And hopefully, my gifts make you stronger as well. Because the body of which we are a part is uh, made stronger in general when we exercise our gifts. And so what, you know, what are we being cautioned against here? Well, what we're being cautioned against here is that, that God does not give spiritual gifts. God does not give gifts to his people to be used selfishly, okay? So because we're not to use those gifts selfishly, because uh, self-centeredness has really no part in this, don't ever obsess over the gifts that you don't have. And, you know, don't even obsess over the gifts that you do have. Just be assured that God has given you spiritual gifts and that he expects you to use them. Just be assured that God has given you gifts and go serve somebody, okay? I watched this uh, thing recently. It's, you know, how many of you have heard of John Maxwell? He's an author, and he's a Christian guy. He talks leadership books, okay? And I was listening to this talk, and I had some of my students listen to it, too. Um, and he was talking about how to have the best 2019 ever, how to have your best year ever in 2019. And what he, in essence, says, and he uses the example of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, he says, you want to have a great year. You want to be close to God. You're feeling far away from him. Sometimes you just need to shut up and serve. Now, that's a little provocative. I don't say shut up all that much. But he was making a point. He said, you know, don't, don't come across a need and say, oh, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for that. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pray for that. I hope you do okay with it. No, he says, you know, just shut up and serve. Shut up and use your gifts. Because that's what God is calling us to do. And when we don't, when we don't share our gifts, the church suffers and the world suffers. When we don't share our gifts, we're, we're actually guilty of, of cheating and, and stealing from each other and, and from God himself. And the whole body loses out. Have you guys ever heard of the 80-20 rule? You read church development books and you're always going to hear about the 80-20 rule, right? 20% of a congregation does 80% of the work. I mean, that's just standard. You could probably, you could probably Google that and you'll have... Uh, just numerous results, the 80-20 rule. Now, by God's grace, by God's grace, our congregation enjoys a far better ratio than that. I am amazed daily when I discover what different people uh, are involved in different things. We have a lot of people involved in this church, and that is a wonderful blessing. But brothers and sisters, we should not be satisfied with just above average either i mean we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves in that regard either because we can do better we can do better and we must strive to do better we must strive to get more people involved and sometimes we have to have the discipline to step back when we're involved in too many things to create those opportunities for others because we belong to each other and we're part of the same body and if we're not all contributing then the body is sick so we need to strive to do better for god and for each other so that's the second guideline okay the third one is this, this is the last one and it's simple use your gifts to their fullest potential in other words be wholehearted in all that you do be all in for the church be all in for the kingdom knowing that you have something to offer okay verses six to eight 
We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him prophesy. Let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him do so generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. If you've got the gift, use it. Go all out. Use it. If God has given you something to do, commit to doing it well. Don't hem and haw. Don't be half-hearted. Give yourself to it for the glory of God and for the health of the body. You know, it's all about having a servant mentality. It's all about waking up in the morning and stepping out into your day looking for ways to serve, looking for ways to use your gifts looking for ways to glorify God, being mindful about all of those things. And I just want to give you a short description of servants as we wrap up tonight. Servants are secure in their identity in the eyes of God. In other words, they know, they are assured that they are God's children and that they have been given gifts and then God wants them to use those gifts. And that is part of our very identity. Servants recognize that it is God who has called them to serve, okay? God is in control. God has a plan. God has a part for you to play. God is the one that has called you into this and placed you at just the right place and put just the right people in your life to do the work that he has called you to do. Servants stay the course through good times and bad with joy. When you have been given a gift and you start to exercise that gift, unfortunately, we live in a fallen world and you're going to get criticism. Every time you use one of your gifts, there's going to be somebody looking at you thinking, oh, well, that wasn't very good. Well, I don't know if that's really all that helpful. Through good times and bad, you need to be secure enough in yourself, assured enough in your gifts that you will be persistent and stay the course in exercising those gifts. Because servants persevere through all difficulties. And finally, servants servants are grateful for encouragement. And encouragement is wonderful. That's actually one of the spiritual gifts. Servants are grateful for that encouragement. But what matters the most to a true servant is God's seal of approval is knowing that I'm pleasing God no matter what anybody else thinks. Brothers and sisters, God has given us a task to bring his word into this world. He wants all of us engaged, everyone who bears the name of Christ. He wants engaged into this work. We are called Christians. To accomplish this, he gives each one of us a set of gifts, and when we use those gifts, Christ himself shines clearer to those who do not yet know him. Using our gifts have significant impact on this world. You all have gifts given to you by God, and that, I believe, is a wonderful example of God's persistent and constant grace. You have the responsibility to use those gifts in the way that they were intended, not selfishly, but for the service of others. You are called to develop and exercise those gifts to their fullest potential for God's glory, as though we are working directly for Jesus Christ because we are. That is our ongoing response to the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, using those gifts that he gives. We have the privilege of bearing his name in this world So let's lift that name high in everything we do in the context of our life together. Amen. Let's pray.